Welcome to Lead Today with me, Kalina. Let's talk leadership. This episode would not be possible without Anchor. It's free and the easiest way to make a podcast. They're creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey, nice to see you here again today. I'm joining you from Zagreb, Croatia. It's a rainy Wednesday afternoon. Mr. Max is here on the couch and we have a cute cozy blanket, some notes, cup of tea, and I'm so glad that you're back. If you want to support my efforts on this podcast, please feel free to buy me a tea or a cup of coffee using the link provided. It makes a huge difference for me to be able to continue to spend the time to produce this show. A lot goes into it outside of just me talking in terms of getting episodes podcast ready. Okay, today I would love to chat about how to solo travel. I've had a couple of questions come through in the past few days, so feels right to get into the topic. I have been traveling by myself and with others since 2012 on and off. Once I graduated university, I really set foot on the digital nomad path. The way I got into it, I'm really grateful. My first manager in corporate, I was 18, 19 years old and yeah, 18. And she said, look, use your laptop, take it home. You can use a VPN. And then on top of that, so that was my first taste of working from home. And the second that I was allowed to work by a pool with my laptop and was trusted with that. And this is not, you know, like now it's the norm. I'm talking actually 10 years ago, which is like mind blowing. (laughs) 10 years ago, I started on the journey of digital nomadism, and I think there are a few things to clarify around, okay, digital nomad versus like consultant versus freelancer versus coach, all these words are kind of tossed around, and we'll get into what they mean, but for this particular episode, and maybe that's a different episode, I find myself talking through different things and being like, oh, different episode, like so many different subsets of topics, and I want to make sure these are laser focused so that if you listen to an episode you know exactly what you're getting. So you're getting how to solo travel, the pitfalls, and I'm not even going to add the qualification of like as a woman because I think it's just for anyone. But I am a woman, so I have a certain experience with it. And um, so let's, let's get into that. I just digressed momentarily to share why it is that I went into or sort of got into this lifestyle and it was thanks to my first manager who supported me to work remotely and then also supported me to start my own consultancy. Desiree is an amazing manager, mentor, friend and I'm so grateful for her influence in my early days of my career. So I started the consultancy just like incorporated a company And then got a couple other contracts, worked primarily with Desiree at Faskin, a great law firm in Toronto and other countries, actually, in Canada, a few offices in Canada and beyond, um, and was working on digital strategy with them. And it truly afforded me the lifestyle that I wanted, which was to travel, explore, learn. And so that's sort of how solo travel started. I started off with, you know, just a one month trip to Brazil. Actually, no, even before that, I I did like, I would go, did a couple of trips with previous partners to, um, to the Caribbean. And I went on a yoga treat for a week in Colombia. I went to Europe with a few very dear friends of mine for 
about a month and a half, we backpacked around and then I did a yoga retreat in the Portuguese mountains at Val de Moses, which was amazing. Veneta and Andrew are brilliant. I'll have to link to that's like if you want a killer yoga retreat in the Portuguese forest, brilliant place with amazing people. Um, and so those are my first kind of dipping my toes in the water foray into solo travel is sort of actually having people around and then kind of doing my own thing for a little bit of time. And the biggest thing that comes up, especially, again, the people that have been in touch have been women, but the thing that comes up for me often when people see that is, oh, you're so brave, you're so courageous, how could you possibly travel alone as a woman? Aren't you scared? What's, what are the risks here? And so I'd like to address kind of the left brain, right brain ways to do this. Okay, the rational, logical part of me wants answers, wants lists, fit things into boxes, have a plan, know what I'm doing, feel confident by means of preparation. And so I'm not so inclined to be that way. Like some people want an itinerary for every single day, every single second. Like where are we going to go? What are we going to see? It depends on your pace of travel and what your intention is on your trip. So that's actually where I would start before I even go anywhere, before I'm even traveling. I would really ask myself, okay, where am I going and why? Those are really easy questions to start off with because oftentimes if we just, even if we go with a group of people, but if we simply follow along, oh, all my friends are going to this place and so I'm going to go, but either I don't really want to go or I don't really connect with their reason for going or their intention, so why they're going on the trip then it might not be a successful trip. It might be if you can just let go and kind of go with the flow. But I found that solo travel is a lot easier in many ways because you can have your sole intent, you can focus on that, and no one's going to disturb you, right? I mean, unless you let them. (laughs) So, you know, if you go and you go to, for me, my family's Croatian, and so I'm in Croatia dealing with some family matters, some some land and such and very grateful to have recently be given the privilege of being a Croatian citizen. Croatia has a very interesting history as does the entire Balkan region and I'm super grateful to have been able to find my roots. My entire family is Croatian dating back at least three generations if not more but three that I personally have heard stories and and know about. Um, and so for me, being in Croatia right now is sort of a coming home in many ways. And so that's, a, that's one kind of trip, is an intentional coming home. That being said, coming home, I felt that feeling when I went to Brazil, and I have no real affiliation to Brazil. But when I went on my first trip there with my friends Leah and Amy, who also were a huge support in me going out and making an adventure of it and staying <laughs> actually instead of we went with the intention of going for a month and then I stayed for three and went back to Canada um, and so again back to solo travel if you go with a group you can always make the decision to go off and do solo things and so that's a good dip your toes into the water of solo travel. If you are apprehensive or um, somehow worried about, okay, well, not really sure how I can approach this, go with a group of friends, but then take a day, two days, three days, I mean, whatever percentage of the trip that you're on, take a part of it by yourself and do some solo adventuring. That's definitely a good way to get going into solo travel. For me, I don't know if it's because I was born an only child. I certainly have siblings now and have had step-siblings along the way. And so my family has grown um, and changed throughout the years. But I think I definitely have found a way to be in my own company. And I know how to connect with others if I feel lonely. I mean, you know, I'm on my device right now. It's like any friend or person is a phone call away. And it's actually funny because when I was a kid... 
I would get so upset by sleepovers. I couldn't, I couldn't go to sleepovers. Like I remember being, oh my gosh, maybe nine years old or something. And a friend of mine, Isla, invited me to her birthday party and it was a sleepover. And I remember going and the whole day was fine, right? Like the whole party was fine. And even leading up to bedtime, like we watched a movie or had some, you know, pizza kind of whatever, like sleepover party, traditional stuff. And it was really fun. And then I remember when it got to bedtime, it was like, oh man, <laughs> I'm not okay with this. I'm not comfortable. What am I going to do? And I remember having to call my mom and needing to go home. And it wasn't actually that far away. Like I think it was a very short car ride, if not a walk. Like I was so close to where my mom was living at the time. And yet nighttime presented a really big challenge for me. And that wasn't even solo. That was just as a kid being a feeling like I wasn't with, um, or wasn't home, wasn't with my mom, wasn't with my parents. So actually, even my parents being divorced as a kid, even when I would go from my mom's to my dad's house, I'd feel homesick missing the other person. (laughs) So homesickness is an interesting thing. It's kind of like getting comfortable in your environment. I would feel homesick missing my dad if I was there for a while and then went to my mom's and vice versa. It was like I needed to settle into my environment. And so that's what I would say leading into the next point of solo travel. Actually, it's about getting into your local environment and finding a way to integrate and be comfortable with it for whatever amount of time you're there. I think that is the key to solo travel because, yes, you can connect to people on the phone and you can certainly call home and connect with your friends and that's one thing. And as somebody that's worked online for years, I advocate for and very much so appreciate the gift of being able to work online and connect online. That being said, nothing, and I mean nothing for me, has ever replaced in-person connection, local community, being a part of the local surrounding ecosystem of, again, both people and nature. So what I do to get into my local environment so that homesickness is not a thing is I will bring myself into the environment, embody physically, I will bring touches so, you know, I might have a notebook or a book that I'm reading or candles that I might bring, incense, obviously I have some clothes. Now that I'm traveling with Max, that is a comforting thing to have a friend and a pet with me, but certainly when I started traveling alone, that wasn't the case. So I've done lots of travel without having a pet, but he does help. Because I do, I mean, I'm not alone, actually. I'm with my dog, and he's fantastic. And even though he's a small dog, he is a bit of a guard <laughs> guard dog, or at least he tries, you know, he'll bark, and he's he'll notice if somebody's around, or if definitely other dogs. So I'm not alone, and that's something. But even traveling alone, I mean, I've traveled all over the world by myself, flying, navigating, visas, I mean, the whole thing. So, um One thing is having a a companion or a pet as a potential strategy, but certainly not needed. This idea of integrating into your environment is more important. So for me, um, I'll find a local yoga studio. I'll go to co-working spaces because I love to connect with like-minded entrepreneurs, um, startups, freelancers, people that are living a similar lifestyle. So that's up to you. When I was younger... In my early 20s, definitely the hostel route. So if you want to be in connection with others and you're solo traveling, hostels are a great pick. I've stayed in rooms, co-ed rooms, up to 12 people in them. I remember in Rio for the Olympics, uh, yeah, it was a room of 12 people that I'd never met before. And it was fascinating. And you had people that were volunteering at the, at the Olympics that would go and wake up at 5 in the morning because they needed to go in for the day to volunteer. And then you had a group of young British guys who were coming get home at four in the morning because they were partying. So it's definitely, if you're going to talk hostel life, um, you know, earplugs, eye mask. If you're, a sl- if you're a light sleeper, you might consider either a smaller room, so with four people or even, you know, your own room if your budget allows for it within a hostel or an Airbnb, private room up to you on, you know, the level of privacy that you want, your budget, and the type of trip you're trying to have. Again, I would go back to the first idea of, okay, where are you going? Why are you going there? Getting a bit clear on that because that's what's going to 
indicate how you want to go about this, right? Like for me now, it's a definite preference. I was going to say need, but it's a preference to have my own space. I want my own apartment. I want the aesthetic to be pleasing because environmentally I feel better if I feel cozy and comfortable in a space, if it's inviting, it doesn't need to, that doesn't mean it's, you know, $500 a night. It means that I feel good in the place. So that's really important to me is environment. So pick your environment that you feel comfortable in, whether it is a shared room with 12 people or your own private spot. And there are so many options online, depending on what your preference preferences are, um, that you can just filter down and find. So no need to settle and feel unsafe or uncomfortable in a, on accommodation. Like there's also couch surfing. It just depends on your level of awareness around what it is that you want. And so get really clear and then find an accommodation that works. Um, if you're a planner, then, you know, plan out where you're going to go, plan out what accommodation you're going to have before t- hand, maybe look at a map if you're driving, like I've done both road trips, um, boat travel, air, you know, plane. And so, you know, map out your route if you want. If you're more less a fair, I've also done trips where it's like, yep, yeah, okay, I'm going to be in this place for a month and I'm just going to feel it out. And so, you know, I book an Airbnb for a couple days or a week and then feel out where I'm headed next. If you're in a place for business purposes, then obviously, you know, you know where you need to be. You you might have colleagues there. And so there's your instant connection to the location and you know your intention and maybe you book in a hotel where your colleagues are. And so you have your own room, but then you can interact with your colleagues as wanted, you know, socially or whatever. So, you know, it depends on your intent of your trip. If it's pure solo travel. So, hey, I'm going to go to um, Brazil, Argentina, Croatia, Switzerland, Fiji, uh, you know, Thailand, Vietnam, whatever it is. And I'm going alone. I don't know. Single soul, completely alone. The funny thing is that even that notion is never really true. So you're never actually alone. I mean, okay, you might be alone in your Airbnb room right now, right? But you're not alone. The second you step outside, there are people to connect with. There are people, there are things, there are people to meet. And so my biggest thing is first, like I've said, figure out your where and why and get really clear on why, why you're traveling and what you want to, what you hope to get out of the trip, what you hope to create out of the trip. Why are you going on this adventure and going off into a new place that's been unexplored previously by you? Or maybe you've been there before and you just want to get to know it better. Get to know why you're doing this, right? Set an intention for your travels. Then integrate yourself into your environment and that includes people. So the moment you arrive somewhere, we are human beings that are wired for connection. And that's why sometimes people, you know, they're like, oh, solo travel. I'm in a place where I don't know anyone. This is terrifying. It's like you only don't know someone for the first two minutes. The second you even get to your accommodation, you know someone, right? You know the person at the front desk. That's an opportunity. And the people that are locally living somewhere always know the best spots. They know the neighborhoods. They know what you can do. They know how to grab a car or get a deal on some sort of excursion or adventure or hiking place or restaurants. Like they know it all. And so you can absolutely utilize the internet, right? I mean, now, again, we're lucky we can go on TripAdvisor and all the things to check out you know, where do I want to stay? What do I want to do? What's popular in the place? But if you're going on a trip and you want to be off the beaten path and maybe you want to do both, right? So maybe you want to go to local monuments and see what kind of touristically the place has to offer, but you also want to get deep into the trenches of the place. Locals are where it's at always. And so check out environments that you're interested in. Sometimes like, for example, in Mexico, I went to check out a local doctor there because their medical practices are different and they have different laws and you can do different things and Cancun is actually hugely known for um maybe not hugely known for they're known for tourism but they they have a very interesting um both naturopathic medicine type of option and then also doctors that you can pay to get you know intravenous therapy from in terms of like getting vitamins via IV 
um, hyperbaric chamber is something I did because of my car accident. It helps with the oxygenation levels in my brain. And so there are things that are available to you in some places medically that are not in others. And, and that's for me what I was interested in going there at that time. Obviously, Sun San Sea, I love the beach. But I had an intention of getting medical support in a place where much easier to seek out your own medical care based off of your wishes and to co-create a plan with a doctor rather than having them prescribe a course of action. So that was important to me on that trip. So locally, I integrated with the hotel I stayed at. I integrated with local doctors and local professionals who were of huge support to me. And so you're never alone in a place. Go and find a community that resonates with you. If you're a teacher, you know, my cousin went to Australia to teach and was connected with the teaching community there and went and taught in schools. And it's like, so you can absolutely connect. You're never alone. Core premise. Um, and then when you're in the Airbnb or wherever you are and you're alone, in these moments alone, I think that's really important to be able to be alone. And even something like some people are like, oh my God, how do you go out to eat by yourself? Like you just sit there. <laughs> and again, I mean... I'm chuckling because sometimes it's nice to just not have to talk, right? And to not have to entertain somebody else or like be in conversation. So sometimes it's just nice. Um, But if you're not feeling it, if you don't want to be alone, again, I would would ask you to check out, go to a yoga studio, invite somebody to coffee, pick their brain, like figure out a way to connect with it, go to a cafe, like, and maybe this is because I'm extremely chatty and talkative, but like, even if I go to a cafe alone... I'm, I still somehow end up talking to the barista, talking to another guest. I've had, I had so many times in Mexico where I would go to dinner by myself and the party of people next to me were like, hey, join us. Like, what's up? I met this actually really successful podcaster who does a Dungeons and Dragons podcast where a group of friends play Dungeons and Dragons and then they record themselves playing it. Like, the podcast is them playing the game, which, like, was so novel to me. I was, I've never heard of anything like that. <laughs> um, but it's apparently a huge thing. Like, 75,000 listeners, huge. And, like, 2 million downloads, <laughs> huge. <laughs> so, you know, that that was fascinating to learn from them. And so I think it's more of an attitude. It's an attitude of being open. It's if you want to connect with others dive in make the first move signal that you want connection ask you know blatantly ask people are so i think in want and need of connection that if you're willing to make the first move that's a huge step and that's i guess where people say wow you're so brave it's like that kind of instant thing and mel robbins has a trick if you you know kind of like diving into a cold pool of water if this is something that you're like oh my god you're you know i would never do that like you're just that's too out there for me i mean try it try it in small low risk experimental ways and give it kind of a five four three two one countdown and go for it just like turn and talk to that person and be like hey you know i'm new to the area like what you know, what have you noticed? And certainly with solo female travel, people will be like, okay, but I mean, I'm, I'm a woman traveling alone. Is this safe? And it's like, well, you don't have to tell people you're alone. You don't have to go and put yourself in a position. Like you don't have to say you're new to the area. You can say you're just interested in their favorite coffee spot or, Hey, I love this place. Like, have you tried any others that you really like? Like you don't have to give away personal details. I know that can be something again, depending on who it is you're in conversation with protect whatever level of privacy, do whatever you need to do to feel safe. You don't need to divulge your whole life history in order to connect with somebody and make sure that you do it in a way that feels safe, that feels like it's appropriate. So I want to get back to this notion, actually, because it was a core question of the people that asked me around nighttime and how do you feel safe at night as a solo traveler. And this is an interesting one. I think it depends on what your beliefs are. But for me, I would say I'm deeply in... um, I'm deeply into a spiritual practice where I'm very much so learning about my connection to God and I say 
God without any, you know, we're not talking religion here and I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole. I'm talking about purely a spiritual connection to God, to a bigger force in our lives. And for me, that's very important and has really blessed me with the life, the amazing life that I'm lucky to have is my belief that things work out, that if I'm a good person, good will come back to me, that um, that there are things bigger than myself and I can't control everything and I need to have faith. And so I'm definitely a person of faith. I wouldn't say that has to be directly related to you know a church or a religious place. So without getting without making this episode about religion or spirituality in its entirety, I would say one thing I do is I will pray. And I made this distinction um, in talking about this earlier. Praying to me is the difference between an affirmation and a prayer. An affirmation is me telling myself in my head, like, okay, I am a good person. I am confident. I am safe. You know, and trying to reassure my mind that I'm okay if I'm feeling scared somewhere or feeling uncertain or at nighttime if I'm alone and it you know I'm alone in an apartment and what if somebody comes in and your mind kind of run runs wild on stuff and can imagine all sorts of things um an affirmation would be something like you know okay you're sitting there or you're laying there in bed and you're like I'm safe I'm protected I am okay I am calm I am um you know I am whatever whatever you are that you call what do you that you want to say that to me is an affirmation um i have found that does that does not work for me if my central nervous system and my body is feeling unsafe like if i'm if my whole body right is feeling like in fear mode then i'm in a stress response and that's absolutely not going to fix me just repeating something that i don't believe in my body is not going to fix that fear feeling And so what has worked for me in regards to that is prayer. And so prayer is, you know, sending that thought outward. So God or universe or whatever you want to say, but, and I'll say this out loud. Um, You can say it in your head, doesn't matter, but you know, God protect me where I am, protect this apartment, protect this city, protect the people in it, make sure we're safe something like that and I think this stems actually from when I was a kid my mom would always make me pray before bed and I you know as a kid first of all I was very flippant about it so I thought it wasn't a big deal I didn't really get like why we were doing it I kind of felt forced I didn't really understand the purpose but this probably stems back to those times and that's actually a good segue something about nighttime so we get a lot from our parents and as we grow older it's very important for us to make sense of and own up to what our thoughts are because when we're kids we kind of take on the environment around us we take on what everyone else says but then once you hit adulthood it's kind of like okay it's time to grow up which means take responsibility which means figure out how to be okay with this myself and of course we're again we're wired for connection it's not about not needing a favor from someone or not relying on other people at all but it is about taking responsibility for our childhood stuff and if we notice that you know okay I'm nervous at nighttime because as a kid bedtime uh, bedtime made me really nervous nighttime made me nervous that's actually something very common right people are afraid of the dark people are afraid of nighttime people get more scared in the night um especially if alone like that's completely normal i think or very common at least let's say and so finding a way to calm your central nervous system down and figure out how to come back to a place of of ease or a state of calm is incredibly important and that's a, that's actually regulating your central nervous system it's not just about your mind as i've said so Prayer helps, having candles around for me helps, or light. Um, Sometimes if I'm really feeling uncomfortable in a space, I'll just leave a light on. I'll leave a light on outside of my bedroom. Um, Maybe if you want even a light on in the bedroom if if you're really worried. Night lights are a real thing and they help. If that's what you need, go for it. There's no shame or there's nothing wrong with you it's not uncool like do what you need to do to feel safe I mean don't leave a candle on in the middle when you go to bed but um 
turn on a lamp if you want to use a face mask to be in pure darkness leave a light on in the kitchen in the living room um there's one place where if i if i really don't feel safe like one time i remember i even um i just put my my suitcase in front of the door of my room and that made me feel safe close the windows or the shutters have a tea have a bath there's a reason why a nighttime ritual and actually it's something you can count on as well right because if it's a ritual you kind of in a routine you know okay here's what to expect and that's calming because if you feel uncertainty uncertainty is often processed as fear we can make the choice to see uncertainty as an adventure it is a very much so everything is about our perception right it's like oh it's nighttime all the bad things happen at night we need to be careful we need to lock the doors we need to like so that's one way of thinking but we can also say okay it's nighttime everybody's going to rest it's time to um rejuvenate and sleep renew as the new day comes everything is calm everything is quiet everything is peaceful so we can really go down two ways of thinking now i understand that i mean that would be if you wanted if you want to do that you'd probably want to start that a bit earlier right because like once you're already down the road of feeling unsure and scared and this is dangerous or i might be at risk the moment you're in in that line of thinking we need to go down the road of calming down the nervous system showing yourself that you are safe feeling better if you're but before if you can head this off let's say in the afternoon it's like you can create and make the nighttime once the sun sets. That's another thing. I love sunsets. So I make the sunset a ritual. I remember when I was in Aruba for some time, I would always watch the sunset. And it was such a beautiful way to close out my day. I love sunsets so much. Um, so if you can somehow ritualize the ending of a day, and I get that it's maybe not accessible to always watch the sunset. I certainly don't always but if you can find a way to kind of close out the day and be grateful for what you did that day and then move forward into the, well and then move into the evening in a calm way that's awesome of course if you're going out to party go for it uh different probably different thing if you're using any substances alcohol otherwise then you know sleep is a totally different thing but um if you're sober or i mean if you're not you could be on a substance and not be feeling so hot when you're alone in your room so i'm not gonna judge there but simply if it's if it's an uncomfortable experience to be alone at night which is very common the first thing you need to do is calm your central nervous system you need to actually make your body feel safe something that i use is also eft emotional freedom technique it's tapping there's a lot of research being done now on it um But the best thing with any methodology, I think, is to try it out yourself, whether it's meditation, tapping, praying, anything you want to do, try it out and then see if it works for you, right? Because no amount of scientific research and studies, influencers, ads, you know, testimonials, like nothing is going to give you the belief in something as much as you doing it for yourself and then having a result. So I would say for evening time, Sometimes I'll burn incense, candles, like I said. I'll leave a light on if I feel uncomfortable. I will listen to a guided meditation before bed. I'll make sure my bedroom is closed off, like like I'll close the door, close any windows or shutters. And um, I will pray. I'll make sure that I feel protected in the space because of my prayers. I'll put that up to the to the universe, to God, to higher power to protect me and keep me safe. And I find a bath often really works. It's sexually because it changes your internal body temperature. So it gets, you're, you're hot, right? If it's a warmer bath or shower, you're warm. And then when you come out, your body temperature drops. And that signals to your body actually to make it tired. And so that helps. I ideally would say reduce screen time. But sometimes, you know, if I want to watch a movie at nighttime, like it doesn't always help. But one thing that I notice... Um, is that it depends what I'm watching. So it's not, I wouldn't vilify, you know, watching a movie before bed, but if I watch something very aggressive and very scary, I mean, this is not news, right? Like, you kind of feel uneasy. You're like, man, there was like this movie about whatever, a kidnapping, and it was very hostile and guns and people died. It's like, well, 
that leaves you with an uneasy feeling before bed. So maybe not. And truly, like even subconsciously, if you're like, no, I'm cool. I don't get scared by that. It's like, yeah, maybe not consciously, but that if you're finding that you're uneasy at night, look at what you're consuming in the form of media. And that's not just movies. That's news. That's articles. That's Instagram stories or TikTok or like what are you consuming throughout the course of your day? Because that's going to impact how you go to bed. Now, make sure you feel, again, this goes back to the first point of environment. Make sure you're in a spot that you feel comfortable and safe. Um, even though I'm alone in this apartment right now, I'm in a building. And so the building, the neighborhood, the city that I'm in feels safe. And sometimes it's not always the case. I remember being in Brazil and one apartment that I was in, actually the whole building got broken into. Like all the apartments, there were people that went in and stole TVs and stole stuff in all the units. And our unit was on the top floor. Um, It was only like four floors of a building. But I remember our unit was the only one that they didn't break into. And actually I remember somebody knocking. And I remember my partner at the time saying you know, hello, like, what? what's up? And then them leaving. And I'm not sure if that was, if that was the group of people that, that robbed the other units or not. But it was lucky, I think, that we were home. I'm not entirely sure. That wasn't even in the night. That was during the day. And so certainly, I mean, that was scary. The only place I have been robbed is in Salvador, Brazil. And um, that was a really interesting experience to let go of in terms of feeling safe again as a you know female traveler it was myself and my cousin we got robbed at about 8 p.m on a street that you know we probably shouldn't have been walking on at that time so needless to say you can take precautionary measures and stuff still can happen but I mean I was in Brazil the entire the totality of the time that I spent there was about a year in different chunks of time um, and it only happened to me once. And it is more common there than, let's say, in Toronto, Canada, or in Zagreb, Croatia, you know, so it definitely depends where you are, but you need to know the local customs, and in that sense, when it comes to solo travel, you know, take an Uber, or if you've rented a car, you know, don't park far away and walk, like, make sure you're in a lit area, listen to locals on this sort of thing, they will guide you, so again, back to the local connection, so when it comes to personal safety, know what neighborhood you're in, know what the conventions are, know how you should behave, and what's acceptable, should you be wearing jewelry, is it okay to have your phone out, actually, now that I think of it, I had my phone stolen in Semenyak, in Indonesia, Bali, so that happened, a guy like stopped me, this was also in the night, we were, it was just me and a guy, we were walking back, actually we were with a group of people, but we had, you know, I don't know, it was about six of us, and we were walking back, but it was the two of us, because we were looking at, um, we were looking at my phone map, like my, the map on my phone to figure out where the hostel was, so we both stopped, and everyone else was far behind us, and we stopped, and I remember looking at my phone, and the, these two guys on a scooter came, slow down and I think I went to ask them or I was like but they had gotten really slow close toward us and then the one guy just like grabbed my phone out of my hand and they sped off which is a relatively common way to go about it not just there but in general uh so another learning experience right and so is it okay to have your phone out probably not at night right (laughs) um nighttime can be and and this is why I think we even subconsciously have this kind of fear because nighttime can be dangerous depending on where you are depending on what situation you're in you know as kids like or even in the media it's like burglars come at night not always if the house like I said in Brazil we had the whole building people were breaking into apartments during the day so uh, anything is possible and so I guess being in that fear mindset is just not helpful Um, If something does happen, you will deal with it accordingly. And, you know, it's happened very seldomly to me over the course of literally 10 years of travel. I can think of two incidents. Um, And thankfully, you know, none of them were violent to the, like, I'm, I'm here, I'm alive, I'm well, and I'm grateful for that. But no amount of preparation or worrying would have prepared me for those interactions. And so that's a very cognitive rationalization, right? I'm just telling my brain, okay, well... 
it happened, but I couldn't have prepared myself. But again, I think the deeper support in this, in this fear around nighttime or even fear around being a solo traveler is one, look at the neighborhood you're in. So if you don't feel safe, maybe it's not a place for you to be. Your gut, you will feel it, right? You'll feel, oh, I kind of feel weird here. I don't feel safe here. Listen to that. Listen to that. Same thing with people. If you don't feel safe with you know, a a guy or a girl, or, you know, you're in a bar environment or you're in an environment period. And you're like, ah, this just doesn't feel right. Listen to that, leave, get out of there. Same thing with an Airbnb. I've had a few situations where I'm like, nope, this doesn't feel safe. Um, in Croatia, I I had a situation happen where I didn't feel good. And I just, you just got to get out of there and it's no harm, no foul on the host or, you know, it's just like you have to take care of yourself and be okay within yourself. And so that's like number one, always. So make sure you're good in where you are. Take some more, excuse me, I'm going to have a drink. Take some precautionary individual measures not precautionary, uh, more like rituals. So, you know, check if the door is locked, go into your room, close the door, put on a guided meditation that you like, pray or read a book, keep a light on, put some music on, like classical calming music. Maybe you start that an hour before you want to go to bed, have a bath, wear something comfy. Honestly, it's kind of like self-parenting and I think that's where we get into and actually that's a huge topic we could talk about in many regards is self-parenting but that's something that's challenging when if your parents made bedtime potentially anxious or if you were nervous and they didn't necessarily soothe you in the way that you would have liked to be soothed so there's a big topic in psychology it's called self-soothing and reparenting reparenting is like this idea that you give yourself the type of parenting that you would have liked to have received in order to change your relationship to the situation and to yourself and to the meaning that you give it, your perception of it. So whatever scares you, this is not just solo travel at nighttime. This is like anything. Reparenting is like, okay, if it's about, we'll stick with the bedtime example. If it's like, okay, it's bedtime and I'm nervous, I feel unsafe, it's dark, the windows are open, what if somebody comes in, you're going down that fear-based dialogue, what would you have wanted your parent to do for you in that case? Not what they did, right? Because we're very aware that our parents just do the best that they can, but it's not always what you needed. You didn't always, as a very young child, you can't always even communicate that clearly, right? Like you don't necessarily share, they might not listen, whatever. They're in their, you know, parents were doing their own thing. They were trying to just figure themselves out. I think as we get older, the at least for me, the compassion that I have for my parents realizing that they were, you know, working full-time jobs, just trying to figure out their own lives in their 20s and having a kid that's so impressionable and dependent. I even notice it with Max. <laughs> and Max responds incredibly to my mood. If I'm excited or stressed or amped up, like he's right there with me and that'll change anything to like his his demeanor his bowel movements his approach if he's really nervous or scared he might start biting stuff he gets like very bitey uh and and he responds that way he i've actually he'll even clench his jaw which is so funny because that's something i notice i do when i'm stressed is like clench my jaw so what would you have wanted your parent to do in that moment what would you have wanted your parent to do in that moment when you're tired and maybe cranky or scared or unsure? Would you have wanted a hug? Would you want a massage? Like I'm just thinking now when I clench my jaw, what I do is I'll massage my jaw. So what would you have wanted? Um, A tea, you know, a warm drink, a cozy blanket, someone to tell you that it's going to be okay. And so tell yourself the things and and put that out as well to the universe, to God, like protect me, protect this space, protect this apartment and the, you know, the things in it and me and the people in the neighborhood, the building, protect myself. I want, you know, I want to be safe. I want to be well. And, And I find that for me, it personally helps to say it out loud, but put it out there. So don't try to like 
tell your oh you're fine stop it like not into this like self-criticizing thing really more like telling the universe what it is you want so outward and that to me is the difference between prayer as an affirmation as i said earlier really asking yourself what you need because these are just my ideas right this is just what helps me to feel better the light on the incense the candles the blankets closing the door sometimes even blockading the door like these are things that make me feel safe but ask yourself what would you have wanted a parent to do what would you what would make you feel better what would make you feel safe and do that some people like journaling some people like a warm tea some people um you know you might want to call a friend before bed or call call your parent or call Uh, your partner or talk to your dog or talk to yourself one interesting thing actually my cousin shared with me was to just record your own voice note maybe you want to record yourself a soothing voice note i remember when i was younger when i would go to my dad's house my mom would actually record this is when we had cassettes like cassette tapes and i had my own player like cassette player And I would listen to these messages that she would record for me before bed because I wanted her to, like she would normally stay with me until I fell asleep. So another habit, right? When I was little, my mom would stay with me until I fell asleep. And so without that, without having somebody physically there, I did have a hard time getting to the point where like, okay, I can go to bed alone. Just me, by myself. So, you know, a couple of options there. I hope this has been useful in terms of solo travel. Let me just look at my notes to make sure I've kind of covered the gamut here. Uh, I mean, okay, if we, we kind of go to the more logistic side of things for one more second here, I would say having your ducks in a row makes me feel at least better when it comes to anything administrative so again depends on your you know is this going to be an adventure with go with the flow or is this going to be um, a very planned out endeavor up to you on what you're going to choose there and plan accordingly this has to do with you know any travel requirements visa requirements entry requirements just get very clear on what's needed and the moment you have a list or a clear sometimes like there have been times where I've needed printed documents for either to prove that I'm on business travel or prove whatever I'm doing in a place or any kind of documentation you need um, visas that you need that all starts when you decide that you're going to go somewhere so just kind of have a checklist and I, sometimes I like doing it on paper to be completely frank with you whereas I know people that'll have you know notion or a task manager and I have task managers I used to do and that's fine you can do it also digitally but you know kind of line get push your ducks in a row because i think anytime we're scared or uncertain or we feel unprepared a list is a really good counterbalance to that because then it's written down it's again out of your head onto paper similar to prayer actually so like out of your head and out into the world so put it put it on a piece of paper put it out there get organized and then it allows your brain again to not be in like you can take a deep breath and not be in fight or flight mode um, you know, stress mode, like, oh my God, did I remember everything? Did I pack everything? Do I have everything? This like constantly checking kind of feeling. And I think with solo travel, sometimes it's easy to be in our own heads. And so get out of your own head, do yoga, dance, something like that. Similarly, make that list, um, do things that get you out of your inner dialogue, you know, uh, a final tactic that I would say, so I've mentioned a lot prayer setting up your environment to be comfortable talk to a friend integrate into the local community set an intention and a a kind of plan for your trip whatever however specific you want it to be but certainly set a specific intention make sure that you do what you need to do to feel safe at any point in time get in touch with locals similar to the community that i said something else would be breathing exercises i mentioned eft so tapping really helpful um, to relieve anxiety. I've even used it for my seasonal allergies, which only crop up at very specific times. That's another episode. But definitely, I would say 
figure out what practices work for you. Breathing exercises work for me. Sometimes I find I hold my breath if I'm stressed or even just sitting. If I'm working on my laptop, it's really easy to just like hold my breath. And so if you're, if you notice you're holding your breath or you're shallow breathing, um, I mean, I've, I've had my own challenges since my car accident and that's a different, (laughs) it's a whole different dialogue, but so whatever your breathing situation is, make sure that you are breathing period. And breathing exercises can really help to regulate your central nervous system. So again, that stress response, because no matter how much you tell yourself in your head that you're fine or something's not a big deal or don't worry about it, your body and your gut is worried about it for whatever reason. And so rather than trying to ignore it or put it away, let's take proactive action on this fear, on this worry, on this anxious feeling, let's take some proactive action and do something about it. And I've just given a bunch of examples of what some of those things are. So I hope that this has been valuable. I would love to, again, invite you to support this podcast. If you did find value, a cup of coffee goes a long way. There is a monthly membership option for behind the scenes stuff. I'm going to start loading guided meditations on there for the inner circle so if you're looking for more of my voice in a structured guided capacity check that out as long as you set up an ongoing donation you are eligible to check out the behind the scenes members only area so check it out some of our podcast guests are also going to be adding some bonus content back there so Absolutely. Have a look. Sign up if you're interested. It's a cup of coffee month. And I really want to, more than anything, thank you so much for spending your time with me on this episode. Learning about my experience and my thoughts on the matter. If I missed anything or you want more info, just get in touch. You can write on the coffee board. So just like give me feedback because... This, while it's for me and I like sharing, it's absolutely also for you, right? I mean, you're taking the time to listen. So if you want more on something, if there's something that I missed, if there's something that you uh, want more detail on, I'm happy to, you know, share more of what I've learned in my research and my experience in my life. It is, um, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know, but I, I have some things I can share. So, uh, whatever I can do to help you take your next solo trip and love it is absolutely awesome. And I'd love to help you out because solo travel, I think I've talked about some of the fears or some of the challenges, but man, solo travel is so fulfilling and really cool and gives you the space and freedom to do with a trip what you want. And it's a huge growing experience huge personal growth experience no matter where you go and what you do because you're reparenting self-soothing you are you know what it is you're affirming your own capability because if you are somebody that's like I don't know if I could take a solo trip and then you go and you do it and you succeed that's what it takes to feel like you can do things right it's like practice everything is about repetition and solo travel is no different Solo travel is absolutely the same. You know? It's like, oh, I don't know if I can do X, Y, Z. It's like, well, go try. Go try in whatever low-risk manner feels accessible to you. And if it's only, you know, watching a YouTube documentary or, like, YouTube channel about somebody that takes a solo trip, start there. Start small. Start low-risk. Start in... Talk to somebody personally, listen to podcasts like this, get in touch with a friend, right? That did a trip like that you want to do or went to a place that you want to go or ask somebody like find, I mean, gosh, there's so many Facebook groups. Facebook groups are actually still alive and well, FYI. In the realm of solo travel, there are solo travel groups, female solo traveler groups with 70,000 plus members. There's one, uh, Girls Who Travel, which is a really great one that I've done digital nomad workshops for they're awesome Arden is amazing one of the founders of it um so community find community in the places 
that you are interested in and ask some questions. It's a definitely it's definitely a low risk, super easy way to dip your toe into the water on this one. On anything actually. First step is maybe talking to people that have done it already because that'll also validate for you right it's like okay this is possible I mean that's why you're listening to this episode because it's like okay somebody I know somebody that I trust somebody that I uh, that I can relate to has done this and so if they can do it I can do it too that's super important as a starting place and then you're off to the races pick your spot let me know where you're gonna go I'd love to hear back too and go for it and maybe it's a day trip maybe it's a solo day trip in your area it's like a new a new place a new hike a new spot a new restaurant go out to eat alone i've always you know some people go to movies alone and i'm like i don't know i don't get it i guess because you can watch movies it's at home so easily but it's like such a low risk thing because you don't even talk during a movie right you're not even supposed to talk so like why not? And then you can always call a friend after to share about how it was. If you, you know, if you're like, man, but I want to discuss it with someone after. Ask your friends who's seen it, you know? So lots of options. Low risk to start. Whatever feels accessible to you. And I know that your solo travel adventure will yield amazing learnings, experiences, and it'll truly be an adventure. Nothing is like it that I've experienced in the travel realm. Solo travel will open up so much self-knowledge and awareness. It's a brilliant learning experience. So I wish you well on your solo travel adventures. Thank you so much for listening and talk soon.